Hello, everyone. I'm Felix, a postdoc for Need for Data at NERSC. And I want to talk a bit, or I will talk a bit about my work with the XFL team on getting ready for Perlmutter. Now, the goal of the XFL project is to accelerate data analysis for X ray crystallography and specifically serial femtosecond crystallography. And the main problem or the, the goal of this method is to use an X-ray laser to shoot at small crystals of molecules. And because the X-ray pulses are very short on the order of 30 femtoseconds, the motion of the atoms is effectively frozen. And so by varying the delay of the laser, you can record stop motion movies of chemical reactions. So you can see how all the movie, uh, all the atoms are moving during the reaction. Now, the main problem with this is you can hit each crystal only once. And so to collect a full data set, we need a continuous stream of crystals. And all in all, it needs something like 100,000 crystals for one data set. But the problem is the crystals are shot into the beam. So we have no control over where the beam hits the crystals and how the crystals are oriented. But since these, um, we need to, to know the scattering of the X-rays from all directions, we need to collect as many data, as much data as possible, because in the end, it's a little bit like um, collecting trading cards where to get a complete set, you need to buy much, much more card pack packets than there are cards available because you have no control over what the next card or data shot will be. And so because the um, there's only one X-ray X -ray laser in the US, getting measurement time is very scarce. And that's it's important to get results quickly and determine is the collected data useful? Can we move on to the next sample? And for this reason, these types of experiments require live feedback. Now, currently, this instrument generates about 100 images per second. And so for 100,000 images, one data run takes about 15 minutes to collect. And so live feedback means we want to know if this data is useful in something like 10 to 20 minutes. And to analyze these terabytes of data, we need the uh, super facility concept where the data is sent directly from the experiment to the supercomputer, most often um, Perlmutter at NERSC. But the big problem is the schedule for the experimental side is totally independent of the schedule of NERSC. So when we get experimental time, Perlmutter might not be available. And then we need to use other sites, for example, Frontier at Oak Ridge or Aurora at Argon. Now, Perlmutter and its friends all, as was mentioned, get most of their performance from GPUs, but each of them uses different hardware. Perlmutter uses NVIDIA cards, Frontier AMD, and Aurora will use Intel cards. And so to ensure that our code runs on all three sites, we would have to fragment our code because each hardware vendor has their own different programming model. And to avoid this and this whole nightmare of maintaining three different codes, we need some something a bit more abstract, some abstract programming model, which can target all these different hardware, uh, all the different hardware. And there are a bunch of options, for example, OpenACC, Cocos, or OpenMP target. Now, we decided for COCOS, mostly because COCOS was already in use at NERSC at the time. And so we had in-house expertise and good contact to the COCOS development team. Now, COCOS is a C++ programming model. But the nice thing about it compared to OpenMP or CUDA, it doesn't introduce any new syntax. So you don't have any pragmas or triple brackets or anything like that. And the two central pillars are abstract execution and memory spaces. 
So instead of targeting device kernels for GPU, the um, Cocos uses a fun targets a function for an abstract execution space. And only during compilation do you decide or specify where this execution space should live and be calculated. For example, if you want to run down Perlmutter, you would just change the compile flex to use CUDA and the Ampere architecture. But for example, similarly, if you want to run it on the CPU nodes of CUDA, uh, of Perlmutter, you would just say to use the OpenMP backend and the then architecture. If you want to know more about, if you want to know more about Cocos, the Cocos team has um, a nice lecture, lecture series, which also includes tutorials and goes into great and in nice detail and how Cocos works and also explains lots of the features. Now, the way these execution spaces are implemented in the code itself is done via execution patterns. So the classical case is you have some, some for loop which you want to parallelize. For example, for us, we want to simulate the, the scattering of the x-rays. So we want to calculate for each pixel of the detector how many x-ray photons will hit this on average, this, this detector. And so in the original C code, C++ code, we just had a giant for loop, which just runs through all the pixels and calculated the scattering. Now, the scattering of each pixel is independent from all the other pixels. So this can be trivially parallelized. And the idea behind Cocos is you have two things. The for loop has a policy, how this should be parallelized. So for example, in our case, just run through all the pixels. And then you have the body of the function of the for loop, which just tells you what should be calculated. And so going from C++ to Cocos means just replacing the for loop with the Cocos parallel for execution pattern. And the body of the function can more or less just stay the same. Apart from the parallel for pattern, which just runs all iterations independently, there's also parallel reduce, where you combine all the different um, iterations into one. For example, you want to calculate the sum of the squared entries of a list. And then there's also a third pattern available called parallel scan, which uh, runs multiple reductions. For example, if you want to calculate the histogram of an image. Then the second pillar of um, Cocos is the memory management, because GPUs have their own memory that's separate from the system memory. So any calculations you want to do, you always need to transfer the data out from the system memory to the GPU memory. And after the calculation is finished, you need to transfer the memory back uh, the data back onto the system memory. And so a lot of CUDA code is just taking care of this memory management. For example, if you want to create the, just an array of zeros on, on CUDA, you first need to create a pointer, you need to allocate it, you need to set the values to zero, then you do some calculations. And then the end, at the end, you have to remember to free the memory again to not get any memory leaks. Now with, with Cocos, all you need to do is provide the or use the central structure of Cocos called view. And the view is effectively an n-dimensional array. So all you need to say is what, what data type you want and the size you can have. So here in this case, it's simple. It's just a one-dimensional array, but you can have up to, I think, eight dimensions. And anything else, they're all automatically zero initialized. And you also don't need to worry about freeing them because Cocos takes care of all of this. And so for us, switching from CUDA to Cocos meant we could throw out a bunch of custom written memory management code and just replace it by a single instruction that says that initializes the, the arrays. So to, to test our uh, if Cocos is um, works for our application, we use the small test program called Nanobrack. And Nanobrack simulates refraction images at the pixel level. So this is a massively parallel problem, which is well suited for GPUs because they're more or less designed for exactly this, to calculate images originally for video games. And the original code was written in C++. 
And already some years ago, it was ported to, to CUDA and we run it on Core GPU. And the CUDA port to CUDA resulted in about a 20x speed up. But now for Perlmutter and in preparation for Frontier, we ported this, used this CUDA as a baseline to go to Cocos. And porting meant mostly replacing the CUDA kernels with Perl 4 patterns and replacing CUDA arrays with Cocos views. This took us a couple of weeks with some, some pitfalls for using Cocos and getting to know Cocos, but mostly it was just search and replace and making sure that we didn't introduce any errors when we replaced the CUDA with, with the Cocos structure. And the big question is, of course, now, how did this affect the performance for us? And the, our standard test, or test benchmark is to simulate 100,000 images. And we tested this running on 128 nodes of Perlmutter. And the original CUDA code ran in about two and a half minutes. And by switching to Cocos, we surprisingly enough got even a better performance of just a bit over two minutes. So it turns out that the original code used a lot of registers. So we couldn't really occupy, fully occupy the GPU. And Cocos used just enough, uh, just so much fewer registers that we could occupy GPU more and thus could achieve um, faster calculations. And concerning portability, we run the same code on Crusher, the Frontier testbed system in Oak Ridge, which has um, AMD MI250X. And the same code, just chained in the compile flex, as I mentioned before, run there for 54 seconds, which can't directly compare the numbers between Perlmutter and Crusher because the nodes are slightly different. But just in general, we achieved um, pretty good performance on both systems with the same code. So for us, going to Cocos was um, the nice, the right way to avoid vendor weapon because we need to be able to use different systems, whichever is available at the time when the experiment will be. We achieve, we can use now the same code on um, the supercomputers, but we can still run it on a, on a notebook just by using OpenMP as a backend. The porting itself was relatively straightforward where there were some peculiarities which are not really Cocos forward. They are more like um, compiler bugs or let's say unintended behavior upon compiler. It's nice. The nice thing is it's also it's pure C++, so you don't need any fancy um, new syntax and you also don't have to worry about syntax highlighting because it's all C++. One slight problem with Cocos is that as it tries to support everything, it sort of has the least, uh, the most common, the smallest common denominator. So the, for example, CUDA library support is uh, limited because it needs to ensure that it runs on all the systems. So if you are, for example, relying on QFFT, then you would have to sort of implement this on your own, which can be done, but Cocos can only help you slightly there. Even by just staying on NVIDIA hardware, we gain some performance because the um, pure CUDA programming was done by the Cocos development team and not by us. So they are probably much more um, capable of doing this. And switching to different hard, we also verified now that it runs on Intel GPUs. So we've more or less covered our bases and will now continue to port the rest of our program to Cocos and then hopefully achieve some nice experiment and results. The XFL is of course part of the bigger ECP project and there were a bunch of other people who also helped me in working on this. And with that, I hope you have some questions. Because I'm more or less finished for now. Thank you, Felix, for a very interesting talk on how uh, we use GPUs and Cocos for, for data. And we like to remind the users that uh, tomorrow and day after, there will be more talks on uh, GPUs for data. So please feel free to. Um, uh, tune in for those. Um, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat.
Um, if not, actually, I do have a question. Um, so I was interested to note that the Coco's performance was faster than the CUDA performance. Um, so the, is that because maybe you could write CUDA a little bit better and therefore the CUDA would, because I, I wouldn't naively think that the Coco's would be almost as good as, but not never better than CUDA. Yeah, well, so I would say you can probably write CUDA code that is as fast as, as Coco's code. The question is, is your average CUDA code as, um, as good? So we've um, done some profiling and looked into this. And what we discovered was, so what the, that, which, where is it? So we have a bunch of different kernels and we noticed that the performance increased bit a difference between CUDA, like in every single kernel, CUDA, uh, Cocos was faster. Even for some simple kernels, which was just more or less a vector at and the at array here on the right. So I, don't know, but like it's it's probably just some minor setting or something that if you know CUDA, you you do this, but for the average user, you are not aware of this or something. Uh, that's very so, interesting. It's very interesting that Google actually gets this right for as you say the average code. That's that's awesome. Yeah. 